Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Library Spaces Workshop Series conducted by colleagues from the University of Florida. I'm Sue Bothman from the Association of Research Libraries and very pleased to welcome everyone this morning. Today's workshop is the first of three sessions regarding the methods used by the University of Florida team in their Library Spaces Research Project. These sessions are brought to you under the auspices of the Research Library Impact Framework Initiative. I'm pleased to note that funds from our IMLS grant are supporting the workshop series. The three sessions will be recorded and we'll share the recordings at the conclusion of the series. I wanna add a special thanks to Laura Spears and Val Minson and all of the team, of course, for not only being a part of the RLIF initiative, but also for organizing these sessions for us. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, I look, I'm looking forward to today's session and, and the next two over the next several weeks. Um, and with that, Val, I'm going to turn the podium over to you. Thank you, Sue. Um, Laura is going to control our slides today. Thank you, Laura. Um, and so Adrian, Meg, Laura, and I are really excited to share our efforts supporting student creativity uh, and student success through library space design. Um, if, go to slide two, please. Um, before we just jump in, I do want to share this morning's agenda so you know what you're getting into. Um, and so let's just start real quick with some introductions because we are a, a large presenting team today. Uh, I'm Valerie Minson, Assistant Dean of Assessment and Student Engagement for the UF Smathers Libraries. And I'm also chair of Marston Science Library, which is the library, one of the campus libraries that we did the majority, all of our study uh, in. Um, and Laura, if you wanna jump in next. I'm Laura Spears. I'm the Director of Assessment and User Experience for the Smathers Libraries. And I've been um, working on this project it seems like a long time, uh, so we're really glad to be here today. Meg? Sure. I'm uh, Meg Portillo, coming uh, from the architecture building on the University of Florida campus in the College of Design, Construction, and Planning, where I'm a professor and associate dean of research. Um, this team, we're so happy to share some of our uh, findings with you and, and look forward to uh, our time together. Um, Adrian Del Monte um, just graduated with his um, PhD from the College of Design, Construction and Planning um, just months ago and is a faculty member uh, in the Philippines. Adrian, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Adrian Del Monte. Um, as Dr. Portillo mentioned, I was actually a graduate student, like four semesters. I wait, my last four semesters as a graduate student, I was actually spending research for this uh, for this project. So thank you, ARL and Marston Library, together with, together with our interior design department for um, giving me this opportunity to basically uh, work on this project. So yeah, I was a graduate. I was a graduate student uh, who basically worked um, some of these, some parts of this research. And he says some parts, but really he had his hand in every aspect of this, yeah. um, and his and his expertise really shows in how we and how we developed our methodology and everything. Um, okay, so for today we're going to talk about the study background. You already are aware that this was an ARL, uh, IMLS funded project. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the ways that libraries can support creativity, and that's going to be Meg leading that conversation. Um, and then we'll go into our methodology. Uh, Adrian will talk about the spatial analysis and the focus groups. Laura will talk about our survey um, and run an, a little interactive piece using Mentimeter. Uh, and then we'll close out with some overall findings and um, ways that we can continue the conversation around supporting student success and student creativity. Next slide. <clears throat> so where did it all begin? So we, there was a call, uh, an ARL call for research proposals um, in 2019, and our team was selected to explore very specifically how library spaces facilitate innovative research, creative thinking, and problem solving. And we weren't the only team who, uh, who 
was awarded this um, to, to explore that particular area. We also had UC Davis, Iowa, Syracuse, Johns Hopkins, and Temple, many of which uh, have representatives here today. Uh, next slide. So the Marston team, uh, so this team, the research team included, it was really two separate um, but melded uh, units. The Marston team or the library team included four of us from the libraries. And we had expertise in assessment and makery services. And then we also had four from the College of Design, Construction and Planning. So uh, our colleagues in that, in that unit understood interiors and space design, and they have a, a really fabulous foundation in user-centered planning. So we came together to sort of answer this question of how libraries can, um, can support students' creativity. But let's take a quick look at our library building, um, at our library space. Our building opened in 1987, and we have five floors of five very different uh, biomes. So we have a top floor that's silent, sneezes will get you ousted really fast. We have a fourth floor that's quiet um, and it has some collections. And then our first, second, and third floors had been renovated. Our fourth and fifth floors had not. So they're still 1987 um, uh, themed. Uh, and then the first, second, and third floors, we have a more collaborative um, uh, spaces. So the third floor has group study. Um, it's what I would call a floor where students go to study alone in public. Um, the second floor is our entry level. It's our major service points. And then the first floor is where the majority of our students study. So 60% of students go down to the first floor to study. It's important to mention that our first through third floors being renovated Prior to the renovation, we had about 700,000 visitors a year. After the renovation, that those numbers increased every year. And we are now at about, right before COVID, at 2 million visitors per year. So we've been doing renovations that have been very successful, but have still left us unsure whether we are meeting the, the, the creativity, problem solving, innovation needs of our students. Um, so this picture here is an image of one of our one of our renovated floors, um, and it, it sort of shows you how we've approached this on the fly without any study behind us. Um, this is our entry level floor, and if you go to the next image, um, this is our 1987 uh, decor of of one of our upper floors. So you can see that we have these old chairs are atrociously awful, but we do have students who have asked to have these gifted um, to them when they graduate because they've spent so much time in Marston. So um, <laughs> just absolutely hilarious. Um, the next slide, please. So we get to our research question. How do library spaces, oops, sorry, hold on. How do library spaces facilitate creative thinking, innovative research, and problem solving. Um, and that's the question that we wanted to answer. And whenever the libraries first applied for this, we didn't, we really, we realized we were out of our depth, right? And so we wanted to pull in people who really understood interiors. And I think we've uh, had a richer project for it. Um, and if, let's go to the next slide. And so what we did as a team, the, our two separate teams, we developed a uh, sort of a four part project or methodology. We had a spatial analysis. Um, we had an online survey that had initially started as an intercept survey. Uh, we had focus groups and we had, um, we sort of had the design develop, which has now uh, been submitted to the deans and submitted for it's at the approval at the UF level. Um, next slide. <clears throat> But I, before we get into the methodology, which is next, I want to quickly say that we had submitted our proposal and our design pre-COVID, right? And then 
COVID hit, and as everybody here has experienced, it's a very different environment. And if you're going to do a space study in a, in a pandemic, it, it's going to look very different. So at this time that, that we rolled out the study, Alachua County was ranking pretty high uh, in the state for COVID cases. You can see on the left-hand side that our our, once we reopened our numbers, I mean, we were 100% most days and we dropped to 11% uh, pretty quickly. And we're right now we're still only at about 40% on average. Um, and so our, our capacity reduced greatly. Um, we had mask and social distancing requirements. Uh, we had to move our survey from an intercept survey to a, an online survey. And of course, our focus groups shifted to in-person, uh, from in-person to virtual. So there were a lot of changes that were made that were not in the initial development of the methodology, but which we had to shift gears for. Okay, Meg, I think you're next. Thank you, Val. Um, so I wanted to um, spend a little bit of time um, trying to um, give you a, a little recap um, of what our thinking was on um, how to operationalize some of our key terms and what that would mean for the study, the methodology, and ultimately the evidence-based design uh, proposals that we were going to be developing, um, ultimately with the goal of a space for students designed you know, by uh, students uh, in the process. So when you look um, at the research, the field of, of creativity, there are many, many definitions. Some could argue there are as many definitions of creativity as there are scholars in the field studying it, but there is um, a clear um, underlying convergence, whether you're looking at notables in the field like um, Robert Sternberg to Gary Davis to Therese Amabile, that Creativity has to involve novelty, so something that is unique, different, um, and it also needs to um, have a value or worth. So it's not just being different for the sake of being different, but there has to be sort of an underlying um, value to it. And the research on creativity um, that really although scholars have been writing about creativity um, since really the, the beginning of time, you all know uh, the origins of the word Eureka, right? Um, which purportedly Archimedes shouted after solving a particularly difficult math problem while in the bathtub and that feeling of discovery. And in ancient times, creativity was really thought to be um, divinely inspired, that creativity was not a trait to be cultivated or honed. It was, it was from the gods. It was mysterious. It was a little frightening. And uh, oftentimes those who were highly, what we would consider now as highly creative, were viewed to be disruptors and, and oftentimes, uh, you know, suffered the consequences. You know, and others who there's a whole time and place component to creativity, right? So uh, Van Gogh, who, you know, clearly um, was highly creative and really um, pushed um, the medium of expression in terms of his painting to a whole other level, only... Um, sold one painting in his life and it was to his brother Theo. Now granted Theo wasn't you know an art uh, you know he was an um, art collector and was in the field but but there was not a convergence between time and place. So if we look at creativity we're saying um, it has to have novelty, it has to have value and there is a, a, a framework that looks at creativity from four different 
um, vantage points. There's the creative person, those traits and abilities and tendencies that are, you know, inherent to the individual. And the, these can, um, there's similarities shared um, on approaching problems and openness to experience, um, perhaps whether you are in physics or poetry um, in, your, in your creative mode. There's a process that you go through and other, others have tried to define steps and stages you know, in that process. And then there's often a, a product and that product again can take many, many modalities and there's an environment um, that can happen at different levels um, for all of those components to converge you know, between. When we're thinking about the library project, we um, originally as um, as you know, and are experiencing and all have your, you know, stories um, about how COVID has impacted us in every realm of our life personally, you know, and in the workplace and, you know, and on campus. Um, we, creativity really is at the top of the pyramid. Those of you, many of you are probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs that looks at self-actualization. And uh, Laura is gonna be talking about that a little bit more later. But in terms of basic human needs at the very bottom of that hierarchy, it's physiological needs. So you have to think about, um, you know, air quality, you know, in a building there has to be, you know, shelter from the elements, you know, there needs to be, heat, you know, you need to have cooling. And so that's an essential need for functioning. And if that's not working, you're not going to, to get up to the pinnacle, which would be creativity, that, that purposeful self-actualization. So we have special talent creativity, but we also have a way of approaching life that is creative. And we view we're in the camp that views creativity as a normally distributed um, trait um, that all of us have creativity to differing degrees, all students, um, again, likewise, and you can develop and hone this um, characteristic. Creativity can be more global or generalized, or it can be domain specific. But then the next phase of Maslow's hierarchy really does look at um, safety and security. So that's physical space, you know, this, and with, with COVID, you know, all of a sudden it's social distancing, distancing, it's wearing, you know, masks, it's, and then it's also psych, psychological um, security. So some people, we all have, um, there are differences that need to be respected in terms of how, you know, what's your comfort level for even, you know, going back in the library? We went from 11% to 40%. So again, that all has to be recognized. And yet our study is looking for the self-actualization that haps, happens with creativity, whether it's, um, you know, pushing, um, you know, pushing inside on a daily exercise that a student is trying to work out and come up with a proposal for um, it, for a capstone project or whether it's a doctoral student you know writing you know another chapter of his dissertation trying to analyze her findings and how can we facilitate that so but the point being is you can't if those basic needs are not met, you're not going to be able to reinforce um, creativity. So because of the pandemic, we really did have to, to sort of rethink, you know, all those stages. Um, so let me, I have, I have a, a few minutes left before I, um, turn the floor over to, I believe Laura is going to be um, sharing some of, of this. But um, 
we really started thinking of um, placemaking and how that could happen at different levels. And we started thinking, you know, creativity is not just the domain of the individual. Creativity happens in teams. You know, how are how can we stimulate creativity in that uh, arena as as well? And again, the library is such an important pulse point on campus and and there's transformation happening you know in the library it's 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 extremely exciting something that was interesting uh in our findings was how really the students do feel so connected they feel like the library is really theirs and from you know we had domestic international students undergrads graduates there really is um, a strong sense of belonging that this is their space. And so in terms of considering uh, creativity, we um, developed a creativity a checklist that was based on some classic research that has been done on identifying key traits of creativity and we'll be sharing those findings. And we were able to have the students, we wanted them to essentially, you know, give us a pulse, what's the baseline of how they view the present space, and then to step back and also think about what could be that ideal space. So um, it was interesting the read on the actual space. Again, there was a continuum of um, perceptions of that space, but there were some commonalities that we could really hang on to and use as a springboard to think about how the what possibilities there were in this space. And essentially, um, Jason Manili and I, um, who is a colleague in in my academic department, we were involved um, in submitting, um, being invited to write about cr creating a creative ecology for this um, book by Joanne Asher Thompson and Nancy Blossom were editors of this, but it was looking at uh, design of the future. And essentially um, what we want um, to really achieve is to recognize that there is an inherent tension in every sphere of activity within the library, right? Um, within every environment, there's tension, even as an individual, between which kind of space you want to go into. Are you having, are you going to be able to, today you want to, to be closer to windows or you want to have a hum of activity or you really are going to need absolute uh, silence. And to really think about um, that choice and control is incredibly important on every level of the ecosystem, whether you're working individually or groups. And we'll talk more about um, choice and control later, but it really, we have the creative person, but we also have the creative process where you're, um, you're moving really um, from, you know, you're preparing, you're 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 getting materials. You're going into databases. You're you're acquiring knowledge. You're doing exploration. You're in the preparation phase, and then and then you move into um, you know incubation. You have all this knowledge, and you're wanting to again develop a thesis statement. And how can um, how can you bring all this information together? And then you go into illumination where you get ideas and then verification is where you put those um, ideas out there for others to react to in the field. So individuals have their own tendencies and preferences, but then you also have a process that people can be going through in creativity. So now, um, now Laura uh, is going to uh, take the floor and talk to you about how we approach spatial analysis. Spatial analysis. Actually, Adrian's going to do this section. So go ahead, Adrian. Thank you, Laura. Um, thank you, Dr. Portillo. Um, at the very beginning of this project, we were actually um, thinking, uh, what are the ways that we can actually 
capture what was the requirement for us to be able to have like a good foundation when it comes to design. And then it so happened that um, in, it was in 2019 that um, some of our graduate students and colleagues uh, in uh, the interior design department actually did um, um, an initial uh, spatial analysis, particularly for the basement. That was basically one of the things that, that we look into uh, when it comes to um, uh, we, how we can further basically our design um, for, for the Marston Library. So what we did is basically um, we, we, um, we applied spatial analysis um, throughout all floors. It's basically examining the relationship of how spatial features of, of Marston Library can facilitate um, users' activities. Um, Laura, next uh, slide, please. Oh, so basically this involves uh, a routine examination, um, which seeks to explain the patterns of how students utilize the spaces. Um, so it, it's more like a limited behavioral mapping in which uh, we trace like how students basically, uh, how, how usually the students work within, within, uh, within the, the confine of their tables or uh, in a desk. Um, so we come up with um, um, 18, 16 observation per floor. Um, uh, basically, uh, I, I, I was there at like uh, at the corner of, of the room um, observing how these students are actually doing. But before that, um, the, the librarians actually came up with a schedule like um, what are the peak hours of the library on a weekdays and weekend. So we identify Wednesdays and Saturdays uh, to be the, uh, the to be the ideal schedule for us to um, to observe um, how students are actually um, working or studying within within Marston Library. So we set up eight observation schedules and it yielded us basically 16 observation. Um, the maximum number of hours um, uh, that I spent uh, observing this uh, uh, per floor is basically about 20 minutes. And it was um, scheduled from last week of February until like a second week of February. No, no, last week of January to the second um, week of February. So, um, I spent basically 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes upper floor doing visual sweep um, on the activities of each um, space users. Basically, uh, uh, in layman's term, basically, I, I was like people watching. I was like taking down notes. What are the things that they're doing? Um, uh, like if they're like reading alone or if they're like chatting with their group mates and then uh, what else? Um, so basically, I look for a spot uh, where I can observe most people in a discrete manner. Uh, since I was a student, I was like trying to be a student at that time. So basically, I, I, I look for a, uh, like what they call this one, um, um, a corner where I can see most of the students. And then from time to time, I move from one floor to the other, uh, basically uh, making some observation. Um, one thing probably that I wanted to share about like doing spatial analysis is that if you can print um, the updated floor plan of the library, if say for example you wanted to do like spatial analysis, it would be best to include uh, the furniture layout, uh, basically the, the, the existing floor plan, so you can easily mark and do um, annotations, uh, whatever like you're trying to observe. Um, so if you have a digital version or an app-based mapping, um, during the, the very first stage of our, uh, of our initial, uh, of our spatial analysis, we actually wanted to do, uh, we, we actually wanted to tap one of our students, graduate student who had um, developed an app for spatial analysis. Unfortunately, um, through uh, because of licensing problems, we we're not able to get those um, app. And then if I know there are some free software that you can actually do like, um, uh, app-based mapping, that would also be best, especially if you're doing like a, um, uh, multiple observe observations, um, and then if you have a number of uh, uh, colleagues who basically will do um, annotations uh, for this mapping. So for our case, we basically used a manual uh, tabulation and mapping. So I use color coding. Um, uh, uh, Laura, next uh, slide, please. So basically, this is how it looks like for the manual uh, tabulation. Um, I, I use color codings, and, and then we identify, like, um, based on prior study that was conducted by my colleagues, um, be, uh, we identify, like, having individual group and then um, in, a, in a group, but working individually. So these are the three things that uh, we identify uh, that most students are actually working within, within Marston Library. Aside from that, we also identify the public and private spaces and communal spaces, uh, pu public and communal spaces and private and uh, uh, enclosed spaces within Marston Library. 
So Laura and the rest of uh, librarians did actually incredible job. Uh, they managed to tabulate and compute the data from this floor plan, the one you're seeing um, in a PowerPoint slide. Um, they basically come up with a tabulated uh, data uh, from this floor plan into a spreadsheet, basically dividing the actual usage of of, of, of the floor space by uh, according to its type, either individual or group. And then basically this gives us an idea of um, th the spaces within Marston Library. Uh, it confirms also to prior study that some, most of the spaces within Marston Library are underutilized. Um, it was also, uh, more students are actually uh, using individual seating for individual work. So these are the preference among, um, among students. So. Yeah, so uh, which later on we can explain um, some of these uh, information uh, that we gather um, through focus group discussion since um, we were able to uh, get some information uh, from, from the students. Laura. Thank you. Okay, so we started out with an intercept survey and it, of course, turned out not to be an intercept because an intercept would mean that we were standing in the libraries coming up to students as they're in the process of actually using the libraries. And that didn't work out that way, uh, obviously because of COVID. So we waited and then once we were back in the building, uh, we were out from March through August. And then once the um, libraries reopened, it was, um, it was constrained, you know, the uh, facilities were limited capacity um, due to social distancing. So um, we developed an online survey that I'm gonna send to you in a minute and you can see how we set up the survey and how we built in aspects of the libraries to make sure that people could see what they were you know, potentially um, voting on. So um, to kind of recap um, what Meg was talking about and, you know, I followed this through and thought and thought a lot about, um, you know, the choice and control and the, the concept of creativity. And in their work, um, Meg and Jason Manili had cited Graham Wallace. So I went back and looked at Graham Wallace's work on the art of thought and the process of creativity and broke it down because Laura will operationalize anything she sees. Um, so um, <laughs> broke it down and looked at the iterations of the process where Graham Wallace had developed four stages, but um, Eugene Sadler Smith took it to another level and, you know, identified these stages. So um, on the left, you have the five stages. Preparation is that stage where, you know, um, if you've, you know, been inside of any research project, you're doing a lot of literature review and looking at the landscape, you're preparing. It's a time where you're working methodically in your own domain. And really, um, it's an intense process of solitude. Um, and then you get into incubation. And this is a part of the process that can be really informal. It's unconscious exploration. Um, Sandra Early is cause, calls this information encountering, where you're not necessarily focusing on one particular aspect of a problem, but you're really kind of looking around and seeing a lot of different things. You're distracted, you're conversational, and you're active. Um, and then you have intimation, which is where the train of thought begins. And there's an increase of association between thoughts, and you start to be a little bit expressive, ideating, writing down notes, outlining, and kind of articulating your thoughts. And then you have illumination, that eureka moment where, um, you know, the there's a flash and an idea, and it's where you start to really kind of culminate the train of association, and you start to articulate um, through your creativity and make your ideas permanent. 
Um, and then verification is this day where we present our research and talk about it and ask you to reflect on it and ask us questions because this is how research gets better. And so in looking at the space typology next to it in that center group, you have um, the spaces that Adrian looked at in the spatial analysis, looking at private, individual, group, and public, and the combinations of these and how students use spaces. One of our researchers, Sheila Bosch, had done work previously and published a paper called um, um, Together Alone. And basically, you know, or alone together, I can't remember the exact name, but basically it's the fact that there's a, a spectrum of working that's individual and group and private and individual. And it coincides with this process where a person isn't always just working by themselves. They're in this path and they need all different kinds of um, environments and inspiration and motivation. And so that's where the choice and control comes in because you know, they want their space to be what they need depending on where they're at in this process. And so for the creative ecology on the right side, for the libraries, this is where um, the libraries um, make this tangible, access to resources for preparation, authoritative resources, individual and private space and facilitated group input. Um, when you get down to illumination, um, their need for creative technologies, private quiet areas, group and individual study, private study areas. It's not just one thing that contributes to this creative process. So we developed the survey and um, we ended up with 12 questions and our um, and our adjective checklist, which you'll see in a few minutes. And um, because we had to do this online, we ended up sending it out to 52,000 plus students. Um, and then we ended up with 608 total responses. And um, oh, I'm gonna give you this in the chat. So I'm gonna have to... Um, I just put the survey in the chat so that you could open it up and take a look at it. It's a PDF and um, you'll see how we set up the survey and you can see the adjective checklist. Um, and so we sent that out uh, online and that was in November 9th through November 23rd. Um, and we sent out three emails to the first week and one the second week. And we ended up with 608 total responses, but only 337 had completed the survey and also visited Marston Science Library. So we made that restriction because we felt like they hadn't been in the space, which a lot of people in fall of 2020 may have responded and had never been into the library that received the email. Um, and so first we started looking at who's you know, what floors were they using? We distinguished between undergraduate and graduate because one of the uh, purposes of doing the study was to understand whether or not we should have a dedicated graduate floor. Um, the fifth floor is considered a silent floor and we assumed, you know, presumed that graduate students were using this space as they do in one of the other libraries on campus. And um, so what we found, first of all, is that that wasn't necessarily the case, is that graduate students actually were using um, other floors quite a bit. And so um, then we also asked them what types of tasks they were using. And again, recognizing the limitations, um, you can see that, uh, students are using um, all different kinds of um, 
they're doing all different kinds of things, but it does break down between classes, undergraduate and graduate. And so um, what we did also find is that um, there was a strong limitation for group work during COVID. And so that was definitely limited about 30% of the time that they came into the library, it was limited. Um, so we basically um, took the survey results, we did a statistical analysis, we did some qualitative coding, and then that led us to the focus group prompts. Okay, so we have our findings by floor and um, we're gonna go into a lot of the findings during our third workshop, but we wanna make sure that you have a chance to um, understand the focus groups, but we did get our findings and you know, one of the key findings that we had was that um, the on every single floor, there was a movement in an ideal space would be less crowded. And Marston is a big library and the basement says less crowded, but um, <laughs> the basement is over 700 seats. So um, whether or not they needs to have fewer seats, that's, you know, something that uh, probably won't happen because it's a very, very busy library. But we did have that comment on every single floor that crowding was an issue. And then the fourth and fifth floor, the fourth floor had the strongest difference on the values between the current space and an ideal space. And it also had a correlation between collaborative and um, self-reliant. Uh, collaborative and social, as social went up, the score for collaborative went up also. The fifth floor, definitely they desired more arousing and exciting features in the fifth floor um, and would also have more playful and collaborative features. So Adrian, go ahead. Thanks, Laura. So basically the final stage of our study was uh, for us to conduct a focus group discussion. Um, we. Uh, can you please proceed to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so basically we conducted uh, five, in total of five focus group discussion, four for, for students, two of which for undergrad students and um, two for uh, graduate students. Uh, within the composition of students uh, focus group discussion, there's like a maximum of, of five students uh, per focus group. And then similarly with uh, the, the employees uh, focus group, we basically have like about five or six um, 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 members uh, for the focus group discussion. Uh, I believe it was me, uh, uh, Val and Dr. Portillo, who basically uh, among the moderators for both uh, the graduate and undergraduate students. And it was only uh, Dr. Portillo and I who basically uh, moderate um, the, the focus group discussion for employees, uh, uh, for employees session. Um, we basically utilized um, online uh, uh, Zoom in particular for, uh, for our uh, focus group discussion because we conducted this about January this year. Uh, that was at the height of pandemic. Um, every everyone was still um, an online session, so we basically have to use um, um, Zoom for, for the focus group discussion. And then um, we also utilized Pool Everywhere as part of of, of the preliminary uh, questions, basically like an icebreaker uh, for us to. Uh, um, get to know some of our um, uh, of our um, respondents, and then basically uh, our discussion uh, was uh, centered uh, on current spaces and ideal spaces. Basically, uh, what we got from um, focus group discussion uh, validated what what was the result from from our survey. Um, so these are we basically have seven prompts uh, for uh, for our uh, focus uh, for our yeah focus group discussion. And then um, one thing probably that I wanted to highlight is that uh, we wanted to um, get um, the ambivalence, particularly on, on these specific adjectives like being playful and a uh, serious space. We wanted to um, get the perceptions of, of our respondents of how they'll define a playful space uh, versus um, serious space together with um, social space and unsocial space. And there is like uh, actually a divide between graduate and undergraduate student, particularly how they viewed social space and unsocial space. Like say, for example, for graduate student, they would um, 
they, they basically would go to the library um, um, since uh, most of their time they would usually spend uh, in the laboratory and then uh, going to the lab to the library could be their chance to do like a socials to to, to be part of uh, 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 to be part of a community and then they considered um, having um, a space within the library to be a social space and then um, some uh, notion of an, an social space would mean like um, they don't want um, they don't want uh, crowded spaces or sometimes they don't want like uh, these specific noises that basically would trigger um, their their idea that they're basically like in a crowded space so they want some isolation sometimes but most uh, graduate students prefer actually to to be seen within within the library simply because um, their environment in their laboratories they've been confined so sometimes the, the idea that um, they, they go to the library to basically uh, uh, to basically socialize so these are some of the prompts um, that we ask uh, basically if they're working independently. We wanted to know like uh, how their spaces would look like, and it so happened that most of our uh, respondents were were kind of um, um, were kind of descriptive when it comes to uh, the kind of furniture, the kind of of, of environment that they wanted to um, um, to describe when it comes to these type of questions. So it basically gives us. Uh, Laura, can you please uh, uh, move forward to the next slide? So basically, they it gives us. Um, this um, series of themes uh, pertaining to how we uh, we analyze the focus group result. So um, on, on your right, basically the lower right uh, um, tabulation, uh, these are the things that we derived from uh, from the focus group discussion. We, um, we basically get um, statics, ambience, amenities, architectural. We're talking here about um, some features within, within the building that basically would trigger their answers. Um, uh, on on specific architectural features. There's also building features. There's color, comfort. So these are some of the things that that basically uh, um, that we were able to um, um, collect uh, pertaining to themes uh, from from the answers uh, based on the prompts that was uh, that that we gave uh, during the focus group um, session. Aside from that, most undergraduate students basically focus predominantly on the importance of group studies and furnishings. So they were very much. Uh, uh, very much uh, descriptive when it comes to the kind of furniture that they wanted. Like they wanted basically like a big uh, um, desk um, having like this specific light or sometimes like a background noise for them to have like a comfortable um, uh, li library setting. And then graduate students um, focused, uh, discussed the importance of group and individual study. Uh, I, I think uh, I've mentioned this a while ago that they basically go to the library to socialize and then they want to be part of a community because they feel isolated uh, within their laboratories. So going to the library, that's a, their chance to basically mingle. Um, I think there is a notion that graduate student wanted like specific uh, floor. I think this was raised at the very beginning of our project that they wanted to have like specific floor for graduate student. But it so happened that most of our respondents would say that they actually wanted to be part of the community. They don't wanna be secluded in a specific floor. If they wanted to be in like a graduate study floor, they would go to the other library that basically has like specific graduate student space. So um, I think that was like one of those uh, information that um, that's common across uh, graduate student when we raise this concern pertaining to having like an exclusive space for graduate students. Um, aside from that, uh, among the things that basically um, uh, that basically highlighted during the focus group discussion is like the um, having like a good set of furniture, like having a uh, having um, to control the the temperature and lighting. So um, um, these were some of those. Uh, 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 information that basically wanted the students to have a control uh, pertaining to their their built environment. And then next slide, please. Um, so basically, uh, uh, in a general uh, perspective, most uh, undergrad students uh, wanted to have uh, um, sense of identity pertaining to um, um, the library spaces. They believe that um, it's a science library and then they wanted to have like sense of identity within within the library. And then uh, it, it was actually seconded by 
um, most employees when we had an interview that they feel that um, in general, um, they wanted some identity for Marston Library since it's it looks like a generic library. Um, it was actually highlighted like in one of the interviews that um, uh, prior to renovation of Marston Library, they basically have like this um, gi um, ginormous uh, uh, sculpture within within the entryway, and it was something that people remind them of a Marston Library, and eventually it was taken down. And then they feel that um, Marston Library um, is almost like similar to any other libraries, simply because uh, there is no um, identity for the library. So um, aside from that, having like um, simple um, elements pertaining to um, attachment to nature, like having this um, uh, biophilic elements within, within the environment, um, they find it, uh, um, um, appropriate to have incorporated within the built environment, like simple uh, uh, design elements that basically will enhance their experience within within the built environment. Um, um, that's basically the the general notion of of the the what they call this uh, the focus group discussion. And then what else? Uh, uh, choice and control. Um, so, so basically, uh, uh, when we had an analysis, uh, most students. Uh, preferred to basically have like a choice and control uh, within their space, so, like having um, um, a, a chance to basically uh, look for the kind of furniture that they wanted to sit or probably like uh, if they can uh, uh, manipulate uh, while working because they don't just want to uh, focus on like a specific cubicle uh, uh, when they're um, studying. So I'm not sure if I cover everything, but so far these are the things that I remember uh, when it comes to the focus group discussion. Laura or Val? Okay, we go. We're now next to the interactive activity. All right. So we are going to ask you to go to menti.com and we're going to take the opportunity to show you the. Um, the actual survey that we did, and we're gonna limit it to the eight adjective pairs that we um, that we found to be part of the creativity index by analyzing um, the differences. What we found is that eight of these, um, and it kind of goes along with Maslow's hierarchy, um, that these eight adjectives really are the ones that contribute to um, actually um, um, contributing to the process. So I'm going to stop. Well, let's see. Okay. And if Okay, so the first question, can you see the results? Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, nope. So we're gonna go back. Okay, so in an I in a current library, go ahead and do your current library as well. And these this is how we set it, we set it up as a five-point Likert scale and the adjectives were on either side and it went from strongly, um, very strongly, strongly, neither, um, not very strongly, or actually strongly was on both ends. And so you could um, say how you felt the current library was. Um, and then we asked them to go to the next part of it and answer the same, uh, rate the same adjectives on what they thought an ideal library should be. And so, um, so you can see this is 
you know, the current library that you operate in or participant, this is how you feel your spaces are. And then if we go back, this is what you would want in an ideal library space. Pretty fun, huh? Okay, so then we will move this back out of the way. And what we found is for our students, um, these were their feelings about the current space. And so 81% of the respondents were undergrads visiting the libraries um, two to five hours a week, over half of them. And 84% of them had been uh, were consistent in-person users. Um, and so this was how the current space um, felt to them. And you can see on the right-hand side, there's some strong unsocial and self-reliant responses um, where students felt like the library could have done, you know, would be rated on that and then um, more serious than playful. Um, and then for an ideal space, um, obviously for the thing, you know, the adjectives like pleasant, unpleasant, relaxing, distressing, there's a you know, big movement over to the left side. And so um, we did a means comparison, which we're gonna look at in workshop three, but you can see that there's movement into the ends on, you know, who wouldn't want a more friendly space than an unfriendly space? Yeah, I'd like it to be more pleasant than unpleasant. But what we also saw is that there was a strong movement into collaborative and public. And we also saw that with graduate students in reference to the fifth floor, which we found a little bit surprising that you know there was um, the desire for that to be the case on the graduate floor as well. Um, and so that's, uh, we're gonna go through a lot more of the analysis in the third workshop, but this is where we started is to see, you know, we did do the means comparison, but the means weren't terribly um, indicative except for where the movement was between the current and the ideal responses. So there you go. That's it. You're muted, Meg. Thanks, Laura. Um, we're going to quickly go through these. Again, we'll be delving in um, more deeply. And Jason Manili, who headed up um, some of the design uh, studies, uh, what we call the design charrettes, um, with the students in our next session. But this will give you um, an overview of what, what uh, we were looking at. Um, in from a design sense in terms of re-envisioning the library. That sense of, of space, sense of place and placemaking um, really resonated um, throughout the different um, instruments that was important. That Marsden, again, has strong science roots, whether it was graduates, undergraduates, or employees, it seemed like there was untapped potential to create a really strong sense of the roots and the potential um, of this particular library on campus. Adrian? One of our analysis uh, from um, given from the spatial analysis was basically uh, we identify that there are a lot of spaces within Marston Library that, that's being underutilized. And most of the time, uh, um, the, the notion is that um, there has to have like a group spaces within this floor. So for us to be able to renovate the spaces um, and then address the need for having like a, 
a group spaces, we actually have to address the need for individual, meaning like uh, providing spaces for individual students, since most of the users were actually uh, individual students, but basically they, they wanted to take over some of the group spaces since um, there are limited spaces for uh, individual students. So uh, that's the idea here is that uh, for us to be able to come up with uh, design intended for individual students across all floors. And then later on, uh, we'll address the need for a, a much larger uh, group of students, which basically can be also addressed uh, throughout um, the, the, the whole Marston uh, Library building. So next, so students in particular, the undergraduates had very specific thoughts as to furnishings and where they wanted to sit and having, well, what we might call, you know, in our field, a palette of postures where um, students wanted the opportunity to, to maybe stand and have some, you know, sit, sit stand, you know, work options or to have um, chairs you could, um, you know, really uh, fold into during that incubation, you know, phase of reflection or taking breaks. and there'd be you know, perhaps some chairs you could perch on and having shorter group meetings. So again, really thinking about um, you know, ergonomics, um, spaces you'd spend more time in, less time in, and again, having maybe a broader swath of seating options than typically you might find in libraries. Adrian. Um, the upper two floors of Marston Library were actually um, uh, most students would actually go there simply because um, aside from it's less crowded, it's less noisy, um, they can actually have a, a, view, a view of, of the, the campus. And then aside from that, um, there's greenery within their vision. So one thing probably that we feel that it's essential for us to have like a, a, a better connection with nature uh, within Marston Library is to bring some of these elements like a biophilic elements like having plants, probably colors or even like um, sound, natural sound, sound of nature that can be incorporated within the library um, to basically enhance um, their creativity or even like uh, make them more, uh, uh, what they call this, um, they, they can, they, they either stay longer or it becomes more uh, appealing for them um, to, to basically uh, uh, use the library often. So that's the idea like of having like different um, elements, natural elements incorporated within, within the built environment. And I think biophilia, which is um, really references our human need True. to have contact with nature also is stress reduction, with, which, yes. which is always important. Um, stress and mental health issues, as we all know, um, have really increased um, during the past few sure. years and having the opportunity even and possibly doing more with um, the atrium area adjacent to the library, allowing students to have these swing spaces to, to um, engage with nature to de-stress, which has been shown empirically to enhance creativity as well as choice and control, um, both for individual and um, larger groups is important. So let's go to the next slide, please. So here we just have, um, we'll go, I'll just run through this really quickly so we have enough um, time. You can see again, um, some of these were low hanging fruit, like replaced damaged furniture. <laughs> and then other times um, the students got really specific about materiality and, and color and um, proximity of one space uh, next to another, um, increasing the ability to write almost floor to, to ceiling and um, to have um, seating and workspace for small groups, bigger groups, um, allowing for, again, this, this flexibility. And again, it's, it's being on that razor's edge between not having too much arousal in this space, but to still have it um, stimulating. That, that's, uh, that's the job of the designers to try to come up with in conjunction with all these end users. 
also um, having sight lines to the to the restrooms that were really sometimes very tucked away on the individual um, floors, and again, over and over and over, um, like Val and her space with her plant, <laughs> it's trying to increase um, this this affinity to nature was. Um, it's a universal trait, but it's also heightened within the times in which we live. So let's move on. So I, we want to leave you time for questions. And I know some of the um, findings we've spoke about throughout. So um, our recommendations were very specific in the end, and we presented to the library deans, we presented to Marston employees, um, and, and those recommendations went up to um, the library leadership board, but also to the a UF committee, because what it's done is we have recommendations on how to develop, um, how to renovate our fourth and fifth floors, which are our quiet and silent study floors that are really um, data driven. Um, it is about a uh, $1.6 million renovation for those two floors. And we expect, we are expecting to have that renovation completed hopefully by spring. So January, 2023, um, based off of these findings and, and the work that we've done. Um, we're happy to take questions now, but I also wanna mention our next two workshops. Um, the first is where we talk about the importance and opportunities of partnering with a, a campus design studio, partnering with your local Megs or Adrian's or Jason's. Um, but also if you don't have a, a Meg or Adrian or Jason, what sort of opportunities might exist for you um, to partner with, uh, with interior design uh, academic units that are at other institutions? Um, and, and Jason is really specifically in that first, that second workshop gonna talk about his work doing charrettes. So these were student led uh, research design projects. Uh, and, and they came and the students came and presented to us their particular um, uh, recommendations. It was so much fun hearing from those students and, and all that they had to offer. Um, some of them, uh, I will say, did get rid of our circulation desk entirely. Um, no circulation desk on any of our floors, but it was a lot of fun to see what the students recommended. And, and there was a lot of actionable content from that. Um, and in the second workshop, we talk about the creativity index and really go into that um, and, and make it usable for a different institution who might want to implement. Um, so now we can open this up for questions at this point. And I want to Thank you, Meg, Adrian, Laura, um, for, for your excellent sections and um, for, in some cases, efficiently navigating the shortening of some of our slides. <laughs> I know this was a lot. Ava. Hello, this is such an excellent project. I love, I love hearing about this. So I'm so glad that I could, I could come. I did have a quick question. I know this is centered on the, um, the science library. I wonder if you would be uh, willing to kind of like um, make some guesses or, or, or kind of apply what you've learned specific to the science library and see, would there be other libraries at UF that would have similar uh, uh, revelations or, or, or what do you think? Is there, is there an aspect of your population that impacts the type of feedback that you're getting back? I think the first, and, and maybe Adrian or Meg would comment on this. I think one of the things is important, it's important to remember about Marston is that we're five floors, but we're a very open floor plan. So you come up onto a floor and you can see all, you can basically see 360 windows on our fifth floor. And I think that, you know, whether somebody wants privacy or, um, you know, to study public, how, how the current versus the ideal and, and how people study independently might, your results might change based on that. Um, Meg or Adrian, I don't know if you'd add to that or, or Laura. 
Well, in uh, we did do um, a prior study on at our Library West building of the graduate student floor, and um, that floor is definitely, you know, it's restricted to graduate students. They have to register to use it, and you know, they swipe to take the elevator up to um, to that floor, the sixth floor, and but that floor, you know we've gotten a lot of feedback about it because it doesn't have a lot of these elements um, of you know having choice and control having any kind of windows or you know that biophilic feel to it doesn't have that at all it is very old-fashioned traditional space and so for for us applying what we found would definitely be of value in that space and you know one of the reasons why we worked in the theory as well was to be able to share this out you know to make it more scalable and you know which was one of the purposes of you know the rilf project so the arl framework project easier to say so i think ava you have a great point and um something that was interesting about our sample is we have a wider swath of majors representing the undergrads because many undergrads taking their liberal arts and sciences classes the marsden is central and it's easy to come in and out there's starbucks there it's but then i think the graduates are more, as Adrian had pointed out, are coming from those um, natural science fields and majors where they are a bit more cloistered, putting long hours in on, you know, those NSF, you know, funded grant projects. And um, so I think, I think that's, I think that that's another interesting aspect. I think the undergrads give, a, again, a very broad swath um, experience and then the grads had some special needs because i know in the focus group those were almost all from the sciences thank you thank you sarah sarah quinn has a question Hi, hello. I'm hailing from the University of Pittsburgh, and I work in the um, Science and Engineering Library here. We are in the very beginning stages of um, our redesign of our space, and I'm the project manager for this project. Um, but I have one kind of specific question. I um, it's really interested in that kind of biophilic design, especially because my library does not have any windows to the outside. <laughs> um, and I really crave that myself. I love working outdoors in the garden and that sun, um, that light. So my question here is, do you have any design ideas or any kind of idea to help increase that biophilic design in a space that has no windows to the outside. So one of the things I would say, um, we actually have plants in areas where there are no windows on our set where the windows are, are very marginal. And we almost need in libraries like a list of plants that are you know, no light friendly. And we have a bunch that do fabulously well. And so I can connect you to my, my plant guru. We have a plant group called Plant Parents. And so they all manage it. But um, uh, we, we can talk more about actually doing plants. We, we've also done aquariums. Um, yeah. And I think um, those can take a lot of work. We've partnered with our, our student aqua tropics, like our aqua club. Aqu that's not exactly the name, you know, but like the student club that manages tropical fish research. And um, and that's been great. Pothos, as as Stephen said, are fabulous. Also, Z plants. Those are two that do really well. Yeah. Um, and then and then, of course, there's artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether they're murals, if you're able to do things with light. Um, 
I, the design renovation of one of the major buildings on the University of Wisconsin um, Madison campus, I was visiting uh, pre pandemic and they had native birds. Um, they had their song, you know, their songs wired into the restrooms on the different floors. And it was just so it was really kind of wonderful and surprising. So if you think of, you know, not having windows is a tremendous, <laughs> that's real, that's a tough one. But there are, just think of all the sensory modalities from um, smell to, uh, you know, you're hearing the acoustics, um, how you can try to connect with nature. And again, I don't know if there are any, if there's any adjacent space as well. Adrian, do you have any, any other thoughts? I think it was covered, but ideally um, having plants and having this sensory or auditory particularly will basically enhance your space uh, uh, when it comes to design. Like um, the use of greens, blues, browns these are some the the, the generic uh, notion of having a biophilic within within the built environment but most especially if you incorporate plants yeah yeah thank you so much you know i mean we do have windows they just um face out to the hallway so oh, no. <laughs> we're kind of the islands in the middle of our floors so. right all right thank you so much Thank you, Sarah. Hey, this is Greg Davis of Iowa State. I wanted to congratulate the Florida team on a great project. I'm already thinking about ways that I might be able to do some of the things you've done in my library. And uh, and I'm looking forward to the, the next two presentations you've got on the drawing board too. So and I had a question about uh, here at Iowa State last fall, we did a survey that worked with our campus student accessibility services group. And we surveyed students on our campus that uh, they served students that had disabilities, and I was really surprised in our results. We got a lot of feedback from students that had identified as neurodiverse, and it sort of changed the way we looked at our library spaces a little bit. Um, we're now working on a project to identify sensory friendly spaces in our library of different types. And so I'm wondering in your focus group work, did, did you uh, come across students that identified with disabilities, uh, maybe neurodiverse students, and did uh, any of that information make it into your, your results? Adrian, did you wanna answer that or do you want me to? It doesn't. We, Go okay. ahead, Val, I'll just uh, follow up. Uh, okay, Yo, you know, we didn't ask any questions about neurodiversity, but I think that it would be very worth, I think we could do the, a, a dedicated focus group sort of, um, facilitated by our, our DRC, our um, Disability Resource Center, um, it, that really, I, I think, would answer some questions for us. What I did, what we did find was that, that was surprising to me, because our first floor, when we renovated it, we did all these flashy colors, you know, like wayfinding colors, you're going to be under purple, or, and what we found from our students was that, like, no, we want muted colors. You know, they don't want to be, they don't want to be grabbed. They, they want to get up from their seat and find something stimulating. They don't want to sit in a stimulating environment. And I, I think that really connects to um, neurodiversity needs, you know, in some cases. Adrian, would you have any um for focus group discussion we actually try we actually tried to look for like specific um students who might be from a, uh who might be included from this demographic but uh we didn't find any respondent uh who, who signed up uh for our focus group discussion so unfortunately we were not uh, able to cover them for, for this research yeah, I think that's, you know, we actually tried to do some focus groups with our uh, students that identified as neurodiverse. We just, a couple of weeks ago, we sent out an invitation and we got like zero responses. So that student group as a group, maybe just are not into doing focus group activities. We, um, Greg, I, I had the same experience um, with another study that we're doing on our web design and trying to recruit from our Disability Resource Center 
um, we we didn't get anyone um, to participate. And yet it's definitely as more and more is available online, incredibly important. So um, yeah, we're gonna have to go back to the drawing board on that. So if you come up with something, please do share. <laughs> and within the, you have, um, Greg, you have such a strong college of design at ISU. Um, they're national leaders, but they're, there would very typically be, I know, on the interiors faculty, as well as in the architecture and even landscape architecture faculty. For example, in interiors, we have um, several faculty. Dr. Nam Q. Park has done a lot of work on um, looking at, you know, more high functioning Asperger's um, individuals to those that, um, may have um, more challenges navigating the environment um, with autism. And um, she's in, she does national research and is, you know, she just wasn't, um, she was on leave and was not, you know, part of our team. But I think that that certainly would be um, so important to be able to tap into and maybe getting local, um, Focus groups is tough, but there, um, our national organization had a competition on designing um, support centers for um, readiness to work for folks that, that, that did young people who had um, Asperger's who were transitioning from um, school into more independent living. And they did a whole national design project that had experts from around the country looking at those things. So it is being done. And I really um, commend you for doing that and know um, several faculty, um, Beijing Kim and um, Jay Wa Lee um, at ISU. And they just, you have a terrific resource, probably a stone's throw away from your office. Yeah, you're right, Meg. We do have a great resource, and we've actually got a little bit of a project going with one of the instructors right now in the design college, and I think I'm going to invite them to your next workshop because I think they might be interested in hearing how your design studio is working. So, Oh, that's we'll great. If, we'll, we'll see if we can get a couple more people to join us next time. Good. Thanks. And I would put a plug in for Jason. So he, he wasn't here for today's talk but he's he was our primary contact he was the first person that I reached out to when we you know we had put together this proposal we were going to do this space study and study creativity and then we had realized like oh my god like we are not experts in this like what are we going to do so we're going to embarrass Sue she's going to be so <laughs> you know so I reached I was like okay we reached out to Jason he is so interesting and and has it can really pull this, like, I think really coalesce creativity and, um, and how libraries can think about space in a way that's intriguing. And he's a fabulous teacher. And so his work with charrettes, you're going to see somebody who can pull out from students these ideas that can help you develop user-centered design. So that's a plug for the second workshop. Did you have your hand up, Greg, or are you? No, okay. We have a few minutes left, but we are happy to take any other questions. I do think that there's some things, so we covered a lot today and our study was had the three parts. They were really, you know, the, the what we had called the intercept, which is really an online survey. We had the adjective checklist and we had the focus groups. And we're hoping to make those sort of package those so that if, if somebody wants to implement those um, at your institution, it's in a, it's in a you know, we, we can package it up for you to sort of use it locally and make adjustments easily. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that and hopefully by the third workshop, maybe have some, some things made available. But if you have any, if you have, you know, one aspect of the study that you would like to implement and, and want to reach out, we can push that forward a little faster on our end um, if there's interest. So 
And I will say, let me quickly say, Stephanie uh, McReynolds is on here. I want to put a plug in. Um, Syracuse did uh, did implement the the adjective checklist, um, and we're talking with them now because I think there is a challenge in taking your findings on the adjective checklist and translating them into real ta tangible recommendations. And so it, um, you know, we're working on on the connections between all of the three pieces, and that's Laura's real forte. And uh, so. Well, we have five minutes of, of free time. I, Sue, you want me to hand to you as a final or? Sure, no, thank you. Thank you, Val, Meg, Adrian, and Laura very much for this workshop. Um, it makes me wish I was back in a library and could, I could uh, be a part of some of this um, really interesting and, and sounds like a lot of fun work. Um, but thank you all. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week same time, same place. Uh, and so thank you all very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.